Hello, Psych Youth community. Welcome to today's webinar, Perspectives of Schizophrenia Treatment Guidelines. I'm Dr. Jahan Marino, Senior Clinical and Scientific Liaison from the Otsuka Field Medical Affairs Team. And today, I will be serving as our moderator for our discussion featuring Dr. Christoph Carell. This presentation is sponsored by both Otsuka and Lundbeck. So today, Dr. Carell will be discussing reviewing the importance of clinical practice guidelines or CPGs for clinical care as it relates to schizophrenia. Also, he will pro be providing a summary of the content of recently published CPGs for the management of schizophrenia, reviewing some subgroups and treatment modalities that we use for schizophrenia, and finally, he will be identifying areas of both similarities and the key differences in the CPGs and address potential gaps. So without further ado, let's begin our presentation today with Dr. Crow. Can you first walk us through what kinds of evidence do clinical practice guidelines or CPGs, what do they draw upon? And also, can you share with us what is the role of CPGs in psychiatry and how can they help a clinician or psychiatrist in their practice? This is a very important question because clinical guidelines are part of our life as clinicians and professionals. And actually, even patients and family members might refer to them. Clinical practice guidelines are basically a review of the available evidence that goes from the least stringent evidence to the highest evidence. The least stringent evidence are case reports and case series, followed by open label studies. And then we have randomized control trials and also cohort studies. But the primary evidence comes either from randomized control trials or meta-analyses of these randomized trials which gives us a summary of the evidence for both efficacy and also tolerability. This would be evidence level A when there is superiority of one approach versus another that has been shown to be present in randomized trials or a meta-analysis. Unfortunately, in many of the decision points that we have to make on a daily basis, there are no clear-cut RCTs and there is no clear-cut evidence. So often the decision has to be a clinical consensus point where the guideline developers take the evidence but also their clinical experience and their estimate of what might be the best treatment and best step in the absence of higher level evidence. Nowadays, caregivers and also service users experienced people with the illness can also weigh in. The advantages of clinical practice guidelines are that they summarize the current evidence. Fortunately, they're often already delayed because it takes so long to review everything, which is why the next generation of guidelines will be so-called living guidelines, meaning you don't have to redo the entire guideline every decade or two decades but rather identify certain areas where there is really a game-changing new finding and then only a circumscribed review can be taken place that then leads to a revision of those guidelines. Guidelines can help standardize care. Guidelines can help elevate the floor so that everybody at least adheres to a certain minimum standard. But guidelines should not be misunderstood as a cookbook that this applies to every patient or that you must follow the guidelines. This is more something to give you the side rails within which you should operate in the beginning. And if you have utilized all of the recommendations, then you might have to step outside of the guidelines because some evidence is actually still missing for the patient in front of you. Since guidelines are based on studies and meta-analyses, these refer to an average patient. But the patient in front of us might be quite different. But we need to establish that first by having tried out the standard approaches. Thank you. And now that you set the foundation of what clinical practice guidelines are comprised of and kind of setting the stage for what they can do for clinicians, um, can you tell us, and you alluded to some of the limitations, but can you elaborate on some more of the limitations in regards to clinical practice guidelines? Yeah, as I mentioned, clinical practice guidelines refer often to an average patient and average findings. 
they also can only refer to something where there is evidence. And many of our decision points lack the randomized controlled evidence. And that's particularly true for the long-term goals and the long-term treatment, because we we lose patients over time. They might not be totally generalizable when they are um, entered into these randomized controlled trials. So we're lacking data both on the longitudinal path of patients, but we're lacking it also for outcomes that go beyond the traditional efficacy, which is a symptom reduction, which often is measured with a scale that you and I clinicians don't even use because it is far too complex and takes too much time. So in that sense, we're looking underneath the light pole and we can describe what we see there, but many of our patients are not contained within that segment that is being uh, evaluated. We also can only look at um, side effects that might be quite common and not less common ones, and quality of life and functionality need to be assessed much more in future studies. And as we are now getting into another decade of research, I think our goals are also shifting from symptom control and remission, stability of symptoms or relapse prevention to recovery where functionality is important and also patient reported outcomes, putting the patient in the center. What do they want? What is it that's in there for them that gives them a good quality of life or also some well-being that they look for? And I think these data still need to be generated in order to then yield data that can help us in practice guidelines to advise clinicians what to do best.